This language is critically important, but has yet to be operationalized in many areas. And so, despite the fact that we have made many advances in red, there is still ongoing destruction of forests around the world and risk to forest peoples and their rights and their well-being and their cultural heritage. There are ongoing expansions of infrastructure, monoculture plantations, logging, and support for mitigation actions, such as biofuels, natural gas, and large-scale hydropower development are all driving this trend. And these are only going to intensify. These worrying developments emphasize the need and obligation for countries to adopt a rights-based approach to climate change mitigation, and the gains achieved in Cancun are now at risk of being lost in COP20 and beyond. And we, all together here, those of us on the panel, must think about how we can ensure that not only do we uh, lose, uh, losing the progress that we've achieved, but also we actually capture the momentum and move it forward. So there's no one definition for a rights-based approach. However, it's described in academic articles, and the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights suggests that a rights-based approach is a conceptual framework for the process of human development that's based on international human rights standards and operationally directed to promoting and protecting human rights. Within the climate context, this focuses on obligations, inequalities, vulnerabilities, and unjust distributions of power that impede progress towards sustainable and low carbon development. But our panelists today will explain what it means to them, to community members, to advocates, and describe a specific definition to apply to the land, to the land sector. And in so doing, they'll explain why a rights-based approach is so critical when talking about the land sector. While my friends and colleagues, we will talk about the, their views right now. Again, we want to hear from you. So let me start by introducing Nina Setra. Nina is a Dayak Pongpong from West Kalimantan. She's the De Deputy Secretary General for the Indigenous Peoples Alliance of the Archipelagos, known as AMAN. And she's reframed the discussion about RED implementation in Indonesia to ensure the rights of Indigenous peoples. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I think it's, this is a really uh, perfect forum to talk about the right and race approach. And I want to start with a question. When we talk about right race approach, who is the right voters? Um, indigenous peoples, when we talk about landscape, about red, about territory, about forest, uh, it's, it's clear for us that indigenous peoples are the rights holders that we are talking about here. And we've been, I don't want to, to talk about more about what we've been through. It's so many people already you know what happened in indigenous territories and what happened to indigenous communities. There's so many things, even until now when we are talking, um, actually uh, some of, of our member communities are being criminalized and in jail because they are living in the uh, in their territory which is claimed by the government as national park. Um, one thing when we talk about saving the, uh, the forest, the territories, when we talk about red, um, we have to ensure that any policies or, or uh, agreement related to that must not be aggressive in the context of uh, setting up the territories. In, in, in what I'm going to, what I'm trying to say is that um, in our experience with national park conservation areas and uh, protected forests, for example, many indigenous peoples have been victim of the ideas of saving this uh, territory, uh, environment and nature, not but not involving indigenous peoples in it. We have to face problems in this uh, kind of this type of um, ideas. At the same time, we also have to face problems with oil palm plantations, mining, uh, monoculture, tribal plantation, and others. So we have to face everything at the same time. And for us, this is really a big, a big challenge for indigenous peoples to, 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 to protect, continue to protect our territories. And, uh, for us, the call is now how to translate, if there is a goodwill, we start, we 
well, there is in Indonesia, for example, there are several um, law and regulation that actually uh, recognize indigenous people's rights. Uh, although we don't have yet the national uh, law that recognizes indigenous people's rights, we have sectoral laws that recognize indigenous people's rights, but we don't have the umbrella law that recognizes us. Although we have that, but th this problem still keeps happening. The question is how how to how to pr provide an evidence of the goodwill that's been already there with uh, with some of these laws and regulations. How, in one hand, we provide uh, law and regulations, but in another hand, the situation on the ground is still not changed. People still being arrested, being criminalized. Uh, you know, it's it's so many. I think in this this, this discussion, so many puzzles that we have to really uh, fill in. Um, there are some good uh, good law regulations, good agreement, good MOU, LOI, and and, and every, everything. So, but in 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 other hand, does it really change the situation on the ground? That is the big question. And maybe that's very simple questions. But until now, it's not yet. Answer correctly. So I think that is the the, the, the challenge. And, and, and as the rights holder, it is important for us to understand or to to, to challenge the government and everyone. I think not only government. How how to really realize, realize the the changes in, in in the community and. Um, to provide this evidence of the goodwill, I think we can start. And, and the government can start. They can start by stop violations and criminalization of indigenous peoples. And after that, we can start building dialogue. Uh, because I, I think the, the the big obstacles of indigenous peoples to have communications, to have dialogue with governments, and also companies and others is trust. That is the biggest challenge because we, we want to trust but on the other hand it's still happening there we have good papers good document many of them already in international instrument and etc but the situation on the ground is still the same thing happen all the time so how this right place approach can really change the situation i think that will be the question that we have to answer together maybe that's for the opening Hello. Uh, the next person that will speak is Azeb Girmai. She is an advocate on climate policies in LDCs in Africa. She's she's currently on a campaign with the LDC Watch International. Azeb. Thank you, Eddie. Um, well, it follows uh, in the lines of my colleague. Um, I am going to speak on food security and the importance of land for security. I mean, this is an obvious link to all of you, you know that. But I guess I have to say again the, what is obvious here. Um, when we are talking about land and considering it in the uh, upcoming 2020 climate agreement, we have to know that land is a very critical area that we have to establish principles before we can engage in drafting and formulating guidelines and climate policies. Um, this is critical because land is not just land, particularly for countries in the LDCs, Africa, and country where I come from, Ethiopia, I can say this from experience, land is um, uh, not just uh, something that we can look at it from its potentiality from carbon uh, uh, carbon markets. But when we talk about mitigation, uh, <coughs> land in, in LDCs in Africa, as you all know, I'm sure you do, is about food security, about livelihood, about jobs, about people's security as it is. People without land in those countries are almost nothing. 
the, their livelihood, their whole security depends on their land. So um, we have to be uh, careful when we consider land, including it into the, into the agreement. So uh, we say that when we are talking about land in the climate agreement, we have to uh, recognize the rights-based approach uh, to be in, you know, designing the principles for that. Uh, in the ADP, as I said, rights-based approach should be in the center because land is about rights to food as it is water, land, and seeds. Uh, but when we concentrate on land, we are talking about food, and I, I will go further in that. So it is to safeguard the sole source of food security, which is land, uh, of the majority of multitude of people in, in Africa and the LDCs, uh, the vulnerable, the most vulnerable actually uh, impacted by climate change. Therefore, uh, we feel that in this climate uh, policies, we have to uh, look into which ones would be uh, uh, that will secure or se safeguard the security of these uh, vulnerable communities. And I, I can comfortably say that adaptation should be as a, as a critical element or policy that can do that, safeguard the rights of people. Because um, uh, we, we have seen studies, we can just even indicate the IPCC report, the, uh, the fifth IPCC report, and the UNEP uh, uh, adaptation gap report in 2013, which said that adaptation in Africa is a must now, because our ambition in a mitigation has failed so far, and the committed warming now will require us to do adaptation in Africa, in all the LDCs. There is no other way, no matter how we close the gap in emission, we will not be able uh, to go further for people to survive without doing adaptation. And uh, this uh, is actually indicated, we, we have uh, in the convention, uh, Article 4, such Article 4.1, is a commitment for all to say that adaptation should be done. And this is an area that, that will ensure rights of people. Uh, uh, in, in those countries. When, when we say adaptation, it can be investing in agro uh, ecology, um, which increases resilience and improves quality of soil and yields. Then when we think about mitigation, mitigation action, uh, we have to identify who should mitigate. Um, and when we analyze mitigation, we have to establish equitably. To establish equitably who should mitigate, we have to uh, analyze it in per capita because we cannot see in aggregate uh, which countries are, um, which should commit to mitigate. Uh, in general, yes, we know that 14% is coming from agriculture, but when we look at it in per capita in, in countries, the developed countries are responsible to mitigate. And when we go back to small scale farmers, they are not, when we see it in, in per capita and in their practice, the systems doesn't produce that much of an emission. But large scale agriculture, which is mostly in developing countries, and huge amounts of consumption of meat is the driver of, of climate change in the world. So these are the areas where um, mitigation is, um, uh, uh, emission is driving. So uh, they, for, for um, uh, small scale farmers, it's the, the right is to keep their um, agriculture safe, but not to engage in mitigation. As I said, adaptation is the area where it will ensure their rights based, uh, their rights to, to produce food. Um, in general, uh, we have to uh, look into the areas where, where um, uh, the rights based approach and uh, is going to be advanced only when we see 
that adaptation is the area where we have to concentrate on in, um, in, 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 in the uh, 2015 agreement. Um, so apart from that, engaging countries in the, in the vulnerable countries in their adaptation is also one particular area that also is indicated in the Convention Article 4.7 that our, our countries like vulnerable countries have the right, it's, it's the commitment of others to recognize that they have to engage in development rather than mitigating their, um, uh, mitigate, uh, engaging in mitigation. So um, we, this is why we say that we have to establish the principles before we engage in drafting climate uh, policies um, to ensure the rights of the people. Thank you. Thank you, Abdel, for making sure that we are well aware that when talking about the land use sector in the climate regime, we can't just focus on the mitigation aspects and only focus on accounting for mitigation, but also incorporating the adaptation aspects. Our next speaker will talk a little bit more about accounting and other issues related to the land use sector. Um, Kate Dooley is a PhD candidate at the University of Melbourne, where she's focusing on evaluating the ambition and the distrib distributional impacts of whether and how the land sector is integrated in a future climate agreement. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Ali. Um, just firstly, there's quite a few seats at the front if people from the back want to come up to the front. And also, um, oh, there we go, I have some slides to show. Um, so I'm going to talk about the role of ambition in how we've characterised the role of ambition in the right space approach. So for those of you who have the document, this one of our principles that we put forward is extremely important is ambition. And in terms of that, we mean that we, in responding to climate change, we have to, we have to effectively reduce emissions. And how does this link to a rights-based approach? The impacts of climate change on human rights across a whole variety of spectrums is very severe. So if climate change is not mitigated, it will, have, it will undermine human rights. At the same time, addressing human rights strengthens our responses to climate change. And we think this is particularly evident in the land sector where we have the issues that um, Mina and Azeb have just been talking about in terms of tenure security for indigenous peoples and food security. These are issues that addressing those can also help us to um, reduce emissions. And so we want to tie all this together. This is part of our framework, conceptual framework, as Ali said, for a rights-based approach. So I will talk about the reducing emissions aspect of that. Oh, that seemed to change. <laughs> the, tone, the, the level of volume. So, um, firstly, the first question there is, what is the role of the land sector in ambitious climate mitigation? We hear a lot about it, particularly if you're working on um, forests or land sector mitigation. It can be very easy, it's such a complex and big area, that we spend our whole, whole life looking at sort of the forests or the land use aspect of climate change. But if we look at emissions from climate change, um, this graph shows the emissions from fossil fuels and cement um, rapidly increasing over the last, uh, over the last century. And the proportion, so that's in grey, the proportion of emissions from land use change is in um, brown or yellow, whatever colour you might call that. And um, it's obviously a much smaller proportion, and the good news is it's actually decreasing. Now, this, is, this graph is showing land use change. It doesn't include agricultural emissions, so it doesn't include methane and nitrous oxide, um, which, as Azeb said, is, um, represents around 14% of global emissions. What we're looking at here is um, a contribution of around 12 to probably in the last year decreasing to 8% of global emissions from land use change. So that's just to put it in context that to effectively reduce emissions, um, a really large proportion of our effort needs to go into combating fossil fuel emissions. Um, so. In terms of um, understanding what this means for land climate policy in terms of how we reduce the land sector of emissions, what I'm mostly going to talk about here is the global carbon cycle. So a lot of this should be very basic knowledge, but this is based on um, a paper that was published two years ago in Nature Climate Change called Untangling Confusion Around Land Carbon Science, as well as um, a lot of figures and graphs, etc., in the most recent IPCC report. Um, because 
what we have in there is refre reflecting the basic science of the global carbon cycle. And I think that all of our climate policy needs to be based on adequate or credible understanding of that science. Um, so what this picture is depicting is is um, different carbon stocks. So we have a land carbon stock in green, we have the ocean carbon stock in blue, and the atmosphere is also a carbon stock. Um, what the red arrow represents is a one-way flow of emissions from fossil from the fossil carbon reserves underground to the atmosphere. Um, it's important to note that that red arrow only goes one way. Once we've emitted fossil once we've burnt and emitted um, CO2 from fossil fuel reserves, does not go back into that um, fossil fuel reserve um, until a very long time scale process, which I will briefly run through, which is illustrated in this picture. So once um, emissions go into the atmosphere, around 50% stay there, and approximately 50% are taken up by the land and the ocean carbon stocks. That's the green and blue arrows. Now, you notice those arrows go both ways. So they don't just go down once carbon, so that 12.5%, um, a quarter of the carbon flux is taken up by the land carbon stock. It doesn't just stay there and then it's permanently safely tucked away. It, the residence time of carbon across all of the carbon cycle actually varies from decades to millennia. So when we talk about um, permanence of carbon sequestration, when carbon comes into the land or into the ocean, there isn't a single time frame that um, there isn't a single number that explains that permanence. In policy circles, we use 100 years because the IPCC has 100 year equivalence of greenhouse gas emissions impact on the atmosphere. But in actual fact, around 40% of the carbon in the atmosphere is not removed um, back into, the, into what we could call the permanent carbon sink for hundreds of thousands of years. So while it might, may be sequestered into land, it stays there only for decades or perhaps centuries. Um, so the, the main point to take from that is the impacts of climate change are felt by, from the cumulative emissions in the atmosphere that accumulate over centuries, and not from the contemporary balance of sinks and sources. So when we account for carbon in, say, LULUCF in the, under the Kyoto Protocol, we're accounting for sinks and sources. But that, that is not the main impact of, um, of land use on atmospheric cumulative emissions. Um, okay, so the next point I want to make is how does this all relate to the climate change negotiations? So this is just a bit of a sort of time frame schematic that shows where land use is occurring in different um, parts of the negotiations. So the green boxes are land use negotiations. And initially, once the, um, the Convention on Climate Change was established, the Kyoto Protocol was agreed. And eventually, well, as part of that agreeing of the Kyoto Protocol, um, land use was included in that as LULUCF, land use, land use change, and forestry. Um, now the inclusion of land use in the, Kyoto Pro in the Kyoto Protocol was quite controversial at the time because of that carbon process cycle I just outlined, as well as um, something I haven't talked about yet, the difficulty of monitoring emissions from land use change. This is a graph from the IPCC that just shows a range of different estimates of land use change over the last 30 years. Um, pretty much all of the major studies estimating land use change. So, there's a trend there, but um, there's obviously a large range as well. Um, so, so LULUCF was quite a controversial inclusion in the Kyoto Protocol because the focus at the time was on reducing emissions from fossil fuel. Other, some countries argued that the land use sector is important, which it is, but the complexities around how to account for it made, it, um, made the discussions very controversial. In the end, it was included as sort of a political compromise to keep the US on board with the Kyoto Protocol. Obviously not a big enough compromise. Um, and then what ensured was, um, what this picture depicts is something like 14 years of complex negotiations on how to actually account for the land sector. Um, we then, under the Bali Action Plan, have read reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation was agreed, which is how dealing with the land sector in developing countries, because LULUCF only applied to Annex 1 or developed countries, 
And now we're in a position where we're looking at a new climate agreement that applies to all. So there's a lot of conversation around how, there's, sorry, there was also agriculture under the Bali Action Plan, but that's only been discussed in the context of adaptation, as, as they've em emphasised. Um, so the question now is how does all of this, how is all of this going to come together and be discussed in a new climate agreement? And in terms of actually getting effective emission reductions, we think the land sector is important. Um, emissions from deforestation, even though decreasing, we're reducing emissions here. I'm turning the lights off. Um, even though emissions from deforestation are decreasing proportionally, it's still important we stop those emissions. But it's important to recognise that the um, forest conservation and reducing emissions from forests avoids future emissions, but it doesn't in any way offset or compensate for ongoing fossil fuel emissions. So once we accept that as a basic principle, then we can start to talk about how to deal with fossil fuel emissions, how to deal with land sector emissions, and how to balance that mitigation action in the land sector with other competing priorities for land, such as food security and land tenure and all the other uses of land. And if we approach the, the question from that perspective, we think that we can come up with a rights-based approach to land mitigation. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. I think it's really important to note how technical some of these accounting principles are and how the policy levels are critical to what's going on, but that Nina and Aza also demonstrated that there are serious implications for these decisions that are happening at the international level. And how do we then take what's happening on the ground and share those experiences with what's happening at the international level. How do we actually apply a rights-based approach in practice? How do we evaluate that? How do we account for, for those ideas in our approach? And um, Francesco Marconi um, will talk, tell us a little bit about an initiative that he's been, he's been very much involved with that actually takes the rights-based approach to the next level. So Francesco is a policy advisor for the Forest Peoples Program. He's been working on RED and the UNFCCC negotiations in support of Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change for quite some time. And I'm excited for him to kind of close up our panel to talk about how we can actually apply a rights-based approach with a particular initiative. Thanks, Francesca. Thanks, Sally, and thanks for everybody. Yes, my organization, Forest Peoples Program, has been working in support of Indigenous Peoples, both in terms of ground-level work, so working directly with communities, but also bringing the experience in terms of capacity building and support for recognition of rights up to upper levels. So my job has been that of trying to create this linkage between the work we do at the ground level and the work that is happening, the international processes to have this kind of feedback loop. I say this because I do think that the discussion we're having here needs to be clearly distinguished according to the policy levels and the political level we were talking about and ensure that there is this kind of feedback loop because I, we all appreciate that the discussion on carbon and on land-based mitigation and land use is still at very inception phase. I mean, everybody understands that's an issue. I think that the, 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 the graph that Kate showed to us clearly described that this is a real challenge, but also there is still needs to be a lot of work to be done to define the actual criteria in terms of the level of, of negotiation we are talking about. So, we don't know yet how land applies to carbon and to climate change. We know it is an issue, but to me, this requires an immediate application of a precautionary approach. So that every time we discuss about land in climate, there needs to be a precautionary approach. Because we need to protect or to prevent that this discussion actually creates more harm than, than good. And, um, but the the reason why is because, I mean, I realize that there is a kind of a crunch time here. If you look at the negotiations outside, one of the recurrent terms is accelerating, is uh, moving on, is accelerating, providing impetus, enhancing action. That means that the discussion in, in, in the COP is more than, than about removing barriers that could be like safeguards or or social conditions to any kind of policy making in climate change than actually acknowledging the rights-based approach. So how do we do this? I mean, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with the crunch time that we are experiencing working on the ground where we know this? I mean, we, had, we organized an international workshop in Palankaraya, Borneo, in March with indigenous people from all over the world. What they told us 
and what you can listen to them on Monday in the event we're organizing in the Cumbre de los Pueblos is that their land is being shrinking, that the invasion and the land grabbing are progressing, that we're talking about 200,000 hectares of degraded land or deforested land a year, and the indigenous peoples are now basically fighting for their own survival. And how do we reconcile this urgency to take action to protect the land with the long term that is needed to define the criteria for carbon accounting and land use? I think this is a real issue because I think this requires, if we really talk about a right based approach, it is very important to place it in the international negotiation, but it's also important to have a different view to kind of decolonize in the terms. I mean, when I listen about drivers of deforestation, and I put myself in the perspective of somebody that tries to work with indigenous peoples, the concept of driver does not include the human rights threats and the violation of rights that are, um, let's say, a so-called distorted use of land brings with itself. When we talk about carbon, I mean, I realize that the discussion on carbon benefits and values in the red negotiations has not that led us anywhere. So, if you look at carbon as the key point of entry for a rights-based approach, maybe this is not the right place. Because you end up by having just recognition of the carbon values, and the only thing you talk about is the right to carbon, but not necessarily the right to land. And the right to land for indigenous peoples, yeah, but the right to land for indigenous people is not about only the use of land for food. It's an intrinsic element for their identity, the spiritual value, the collective, cosmo, the cosmovision, the same survival, the self-determination. So how do we reconcile these elements? How do we decolonize in the debate? I think that, you know, I was in the Global Landscape Forum last year, and I started to think about global, landscape and forum. And this is right here, right? For global, okay, how do we reconcile the local needs for resistance and reprotection of land with the global policy making? Landscape, who defines what the landscape is? What is the landscape? Is it about land? Is it about humans? Is it about power asymmetries in the use of land or access of land? Is it about conflicting land titling? 80% of the, of the forest in Peru is a conflicting land titles. You have indigenous people's land, and, and there is an overlap of mining and infrastructure development. This is, this is an issue about power asymmetries. And then I heard in the Global Landscape Forum last year, well, the solution is a multi-stakeholder approach to ensure a rights-based approach and participation. But the multi-stakeholder approach does not capture the power asymmetries. Indigenous peoples, for instance, and local communities that are excluded from policy, decision-making processes have not the same bargaining power of transnational companies or of land scale and owners. So I think these are issues that to me really have to be taken into account. And lastly, maybe when we talk about land rights, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. The FAO, in the opposite uh, hall, I heard a very interesting presentation. The FAO was talking about the voluntary guidelines on land tenure that do recognize free priority for consent. They're voluntary though. So they might just need to be made operational. And then we will start from recognizing the rights of land and then see how this could actually have also spin off on carbon sequestration or carbon mitigation. But if we start from the carbon perspective, we risk of getting the old rights-based focus a bit diluted. So I think these are actually very challenging discussions. And I hope to see you also uh, on Monday to continue to share. The, the Palakaraya Declaration is a declaration of indigenous peoples that formulates very clear demands. Protection of the rights of, to land, territory, and resources. Stop consumption, trade, and production of deforestation products. Recognize the role of indigenous peoples with their traditional knowledge in mitigation and adaptation and support access to financial resources, but also to international decision-making policy bodies. Thank you so much, Francesca. <clears throat> I think from the four of your panelists here, you've heard different perspectives on the various principles that we've identified thus far as a rights-based approach. We've talked about uh, rights from the land perspective, land rights. We've talked about security and equity. We've talked about uh, ambition. And we've talked about it not only from the international level, but we've talked about it from the ground. 
There are a lot of rich ideas that we've shared and questions that we have that we've been grappling with amongst ourselves. We're hoping that if you haven't thought about this before, that these you know, short introductions were sparked some interest amongst some of you. And we'd really like to ask for some opinions from the floor, either about any of the one principles that we've, we've shared in the briefing paper and what we've talked about here, as well as kind of digging a little deeper as to what Francesco said with regards to how do we actually apply a rights-based approach? How do we use it to deal with these power dynamics? So um, I guess first we'll start with questions or ideas, and then if people don't have any general ones, we have plenty we can target. Are there any microphones in the back, or should we? There's two. Just to follow up on Francesco's uh, yeah. comment, because uh, as soon as you mentioned food security, I started thinking of rights-based approach to food security. Which is, so, mm -hmm. yeah. but there, there is a right, I mean, a right to food. So is it being used in the, <coughs> these processes or not? Should it? I mean, or would it uh, make things more complicated than necessary? Can you introduce yourself, please? Uh, my name is Philippe Dardenne. I work for the World Bank. We'll take a couple of questions. A couple of questions and comments, and then we'll move on. Thank you. My name, my name is Carl. I work for Care International. Uh, and it's, it's um, directly related to the, to the first question on, on, on the right to food. There are some there are some rights based avenues that are that offer perhaps less complexity and more opportunity than others. Land uh, tenure is is complex and controversial, and some of the other issues that that have been mentioned uh, by the panel are, are 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 complex. One that might offer uh, opportunity and a, and a question is to the panel is 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 to is to is to look more at at the right to food in terms of the right to health. So the nutrition dimension, I think most of us are, are probably more interested in, in the, the, the food security of the bottom the bottom billion rather than the six or seven billion that we have. So I wonder if the right the right to health from a nutrition perspective is an angle that that uh, we could take that is less complex because uh, most governments wouldn't wouldn't argue with that. Thank you. I think since those two questions are somewhat similar, I think maybe we'll, we'll start with that and see if anybody else. Um, yeah. Um, the question is quite simple, I think. You were asking whether the food security issue has been taken care of or taking into due consideration in the NFCC, that's what we're talking about, right? Well, the answer is that uh, there is a letter of special rapporteurs, a mandate order for the UN on human rights, or right to food, right to health, indigenous people's rights, that actually recently wrote to the UNFCC to urge for a clear insertion and consideration of the rights-based approach into the climate change negotiations. To me, this is an answer. The answer is that no, there's not been any real consideration yet in the climate change negotiations. But although there's been a lot of recognition, like the Cancun Agreement, put in their preambular that can, climate change should, should, is a human rights issue, that any mitigation and adaptation actions should be also respecting human rights, but then there is no step forward in terms of operationalizing that, safeguarding the rights and promoting the rights in all these actions. That, mm, and then I would also recommend that when you talk about food security, you also talk about food sovereignty. Because food sovereignty is, is about self-production of food. It's about challenging also the production, the transformation of food as a global market commodity. Because you can secure food, but you can secure food by providing access to money that can be used to buy you know, junk food for indigenous peoples. When you talk about food sovereignty, you talk about the capacity of producing your own food. And continue to I nurture this, depend, this, this relationship to land and food as part of your cosmovision and your identity and self-determination. Thanks, Francesco. Um, <coughs> I, I just want to say, I don't know, maybe it's an addition. A uh, simple thing is that the, the process in the um, uh, agreement, in the framework, 
it's going so fast. Although um, in the even the, the objective of the convention is really to 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 mitigate, not threaten food security, food production in general. But um, such um, uh, elements like carbon uh, utilization in the land sector going fast can um, uh, endanger the, the issue of food security. So w w there is a fear that this will be undermined. People will be only thinking of the uh, carbon market than the, the security of food for people. Uh, and this is why we have to uh, um, uh, um, shout that we have to remind uh, negotiators to think, first of all, when they are uh, uh, looking into markets that they have to recognize the principles when we are talking about carbons and land, uh, they have to think of uh, food security for people. That is the major issue, particularly in, in, in vulnerable countries. So I don't think it is, it is uh, looked as a major issue in the uh, I want to add to, to that. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a report by the Special Rapporteur on Food Security uh, about the impact of extractive industries to the food security, and in, in, especially in indigenous territories. It's including the oil plantations, that it's uh, threatened the, security, the food security of the people. I think the, you can also look at that uh, report. It's a very interesting report, and there was an exchange uh, letters between the Special Rapporteur on Food Security with the Special Rapporteur on the Exotic Industry. And uh, I think that, that you can check on that uh, report as well. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, let's go for some more questions or comments or ideas on a rights-based approach to the land use sector. Uh, thank you for the ex excellent panel and presentation. My question is specific to uh, Ms. Azad. Uh, I would say land giving rather than land grabbing because uh, you know countries are continuing to give away land for large scale investment. So I want to know from Ms. Azir whether it's a lost cost in Africa that country, countries are continuing to <coughs> give away lands and thereby displacing indigenous people and you know all these questions come after that. So what's happening and what can be done? Thank you. Can you introduce yourself to just? We're, we're trying to create a dialogue, and even though we are on a panel and it's hard, we do think it's important to know who's in the room and how we can contribute to building this idea of a rights-based approach moving forward. We're really, really hoping that you want to be a part of this. This is a critical time for us to be working on this approach. We've proposed some principles, and we know they need to be developed further, and so it's helpful to know. So all I'd like to say, please introduce yourself. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself earlier. Uh, my name is Satish Kumar. I'm working for Addis Ababa University from Ethiopia. And I would definitely would like to be part of the group that we're setting. Thank you. Can we take one or two other comments and questions? Um, I'm Jonas Hein from the German Development Institute. <clears throat> I have a comment and maybe a question at the same time. So. I think Red provided uh, a lot of agency for, for indigenous groups and, and local communities all over the world to just to highlight these structural inequalities and, and also in some of the existing power asymmetries at global venues, the Global Landscape Forum or the Kumara Pueblos that we have next week. And um, I did research on, on Red Plus projects in Peru and Indonesia, and uh, there we found, for instance, that Indigenous communities have quite good access, for instance, in Peru to uh, civil society platforms to influence also the formal process. So somehow, indigenous groups such as IDES have been able to, to argue for at least for new mapping exercises and things like that. But um, on the other hand, we have, for instance, non-indigenous migrant groups that are so their voice is not has not been heard so far. So they even have in some situations less rights than indigenous people because they do not have the opportunity to to claim land uh, to claim land because they don't have ancestral rights. And for instance, I found in the Red Project in Indonesia the situation that in fact only indigenous communities had the opportunity to access community benefits. And so the, the migrant groups that somehow even 
got the permit of the indigenous people to live there, but they had not the opportunity to access community benefits. So, and somehow these, in some cases, even poorer communities are left out of the debate. Thanks, it's a really important Thank you. Um, I'm Ceci. Uh, I'm coming from Cameroon. I'm leading a regional network we call the African Human Network for Community Management of Forests. I mean, I'd like to make a comment, maybe uh, also ask a question. Uh, my comment is on uh, uh, right based approach, adaptation. Uh, I'm, I'm lacking the, the, the gender aspect of that. Um, I'm, I'm always very curious to uh, to understand how you consider the, the relation between uh, men and women in all these approaches we are talking about. If you go to adaptation and if you go to food security and we try to understand who is doing what to ensure food security, you will see that the role of women is extremely important in that. If we get back to the tenure issues, you will understand that the situation of women compared to uh, that of the men in accessing land or getting right to land is a, a very difficult one in all LDCs or African countries. So maybe is it not possible when we are building up uh, this type of exchanges or reflection to really consider the women, when we are talking about local communities, I agree with that, but local communities is not an homogeneous group. It is very heterogeneous. Even if you get back to IP, eh, indigenous people, they have men and women, and the, the same state, they, don't, they don't have the same status uh, when you are men or when you are women. It, it, can we really make sure that gender or women, especially, are also part of a specific group of interest in all what we will be going uh, through in, in, in this right based approach. How can you see it? Uh, uh, have you any experiences where you really think it's something uh, we can just say local community or indigenous people? Or it, it, it's, it should be, I mean, something very specific. Thank you. Maybe a question to Kate. I'm, I'm very much interested in uh, the, the way you you analyze the the, uh, the the global warming, but you know in, in all these questions, and I will come back to I uh, related to uh, land grabbing. Uh, how do you see the relation between deforestation through the land grabbing system and uh, uh, um, the, the, the the global warming? Is it do you have any any information on that? Are we are we considering that that it's a little bit smaller than the global uh, responsible of uh, responses to the global warming? Thank you. Thanks for, for all your questions. I think we'll start with. You want to start? Yeah. Um, just to quickly answer, Dr. Satish. Um, as you know, I mean, land grabbing in Ethiopia so far is not connected to carbon market, but it will very soon. Well, in a way it is, but yeah, not all. Most of it is uh, uh, biofuels uh, and uh, food, food production for other countries. But it will, it will go to that, and that's why we have started this campaign now that when the, the new agreement is coming, that it has to concentrate to, to show what has happened and what is going to happen because of this uh, carbon market. So uh, I don't think it's a lost case. It is something that we can correct. But we have to campaign very hard from now. And the, the, the gender issue, it's just a time constraint. The rights-based approach itself includes gender issues. I think it's within it. It's not that we didn't say that. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't say that. But the uh, in, in the LDCs in Africa, I think when we talk about farmers, we can easily say female-headed uh, households, farmers are the majority who are vulnerable to climate change, the first. And because they are mostly involved in agricultural practices. So you are absolutely right. It's just an omission 
because of time and uh, the, the setup of the discussion. But I would say that, yeah. But it was a uh, land grabbing issue was stated in, in the conceptual presentation at the beginning by Ellie herself, I think. Um, okay, I want to respond a little bit to the land grabbing giveaway and land give the land grabbing question from Cecile, but also the land giveaway sort of concept. And also to speak to the previous question about is the rights to food being discussed in the negotiations? And as the other panelists said, it's not that this whole rights to food, rights to health, um, even rights to land are not really um, prominent in the negotiations. What we have there is, <coughs> as I pointed out in that schematic, that ADP is being negotiated under the convention. The convention includes certain principles, including the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and equity. And when we, just, when we elaborated on food security in our principles document, it comes out of the principle of equity. And this is talking to the idea of equitable um, share of the atmospheric space for all. And this relates to food security in terms of, if we look now at, this is what Azeb said, if we look now at um, consumption of, of food, like um, meat consumption in particular, but consumption of commodities and food items which give rise to the emissions from agriculture, it's overwhelmingly in developed countries. Um, or even without it mattering if it's developed and developing, it's overwhelmingly in a mi minority of countries and by a minority of people who are consuming um, and, and leading to agricultural emissions. So what this means in terms of land giveaways is um, Ethiopia or any other country is not running around begging other countries to take its land away from it. That sure, the government plays a big role in, um, in terms of wheat laws and regulations, but it's due to pressure from global demand and consumption that that land is being given away. So it's not a one-way thing, nor is it a one-way land grabbing thing, but I think we have to recognize the role of consumption here. And so if we address consumption from the perspective of equity, then we're reducing consumption, reducing the pressure on land giveaways, and also giving space for food security by allowing some countries with lower share of agricultural emissions to increase those emissions for food security, and that usually comes down to smallholder farmers, and then you get to the issues of rights and women and communities and different stakeholder groups. I just want to add that the reason why we're talking about rights more broadly, and it's fantastic that, that we are, is that in the land sector discussions, there are these different technical experts because of the way that we've been talking about these issues in the convention. There are experts in forests, there are experts in agriculture. And the land sector offers us a very important opportunity to be able to come together, share our expertise, and make sure that we understand where each other is coming from. And so the, by framing it in terms of rights, we're not only talking about right to food and right to land and right to water, we're talking about right to participate, we're talking about a right to a healthy environment. We're talk, we're, we have to include that environmental perspective in addition to the human rights as well, and these are important to incorporate. And as we evolve, um, with this idea, again, we're getting feedback from partners who are in these different sectors saying we want to see biodiversity, we want to make sure when we're talking about food security, we're focusing on the small farmers. We're not talking about the industrial drivers of deforestation. So, other questions and comments? Hi, I'm from the University of British Columbia, I'm faculty of forestry, and also a research associate with the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. And I think the comment you just made of thinking about larger scale pressures <coughs> or industrial drivers on um, forest loss. One area that I currently focus on are forest mining conflicts from the informal mining sector. So this is artisanal <coughs> small scale operations that tend to have very rudimentary um, techniques and very few incentives to restore the environment, but a lot of the time um, directly contribute to forest loss, contamination, and increased incidences of HIV as well as malaria. And so in terms of thinking about the impact of landscape legacies and long-term contamination, I was wondering if there's any sort of discussion of these more informal sectors that are um, very, very extensive, such as Indonesia as, as well. So. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Taifika uh, Roberts, and uh, I'm from Uganda. I just have a few comments. 
we have talked about rights in different frameworks within the General Assembly. Right. And for some of you who are being in New York, you know, when you start to write in a the talk, then you're opening up uh, a lot of noise in the movie. But there seems to be a mismatch between the issue of global rights discussion and, and the national discussion, in a sense that um, what we have come to understand over years is that rights must be demanded at the local level. And that is where I think many of these forums miss it. If I give an example of the rights of indigenous people, this has been done at the local level. To me, it's an exceptional work that even the world about respects in its you know, environment that we you go to get, we are not going to have to give them a clear policy guidance and what. But the question is, what happens at national level? But we don't always discuss this because, you know, national level discussion is always legislation. And to me, it's where we have problems. If you do a survey of some of the LDC countries and you look at how they respect rights of even the minority society, about indigenous peoples and the forest uh, communities, you never find them recognized in the domain of the national legislation. And the, the, I always laugh because I had a colleague who was telling me some of these conventions have the principle of good faith for some of the lawyers, you know, which we always hide in when we are implementing the international conventions and laws, even when we have no. Uh, similar legislation. But still, that is not enough. And uh, it is what I'm putting to the panel is how do you guide uh, some of us, even in these negotiations, to, to feature such a discussion or such an enabling framework? Uh, lastly, is um, the UNFCC, all of you know, it's a convention. Simply a climate convention. But over the years, I know with growing science, we are bringing so many things to the UNMCC convention. You know, the recent discussion I've been having in the negotiation has been the Standing Committee on Finance to discuss forest finance. And I remember in the side event where Brazil uh, and Uganda tried to main focus that we requested the Standing Committee to look within. The aspects under this convention because we, we don't want them to open up so many things. And the same thing here looks at the right based action is that what specifics should we have discussed in this convention? Thank you very much. Thanks. I think we'll take one more and then jump into some. some Hi, my name is Brian Sitube. I, I am Peruvian. I work at Nivelula. And uh, I have a question. First, I'm going to comment, and then I'm going to ask a question. And I expect an uh, uh, answer from the, from the panelists, but especially from Francesco. So uh, here's my question. Uh, naturally, uh, red is focused on carbon, because carbon, is, carbon sequestration is an ecosystem service that benefits the whole world, especially under the UNFCC's objectives. This is basic. Um, now, Red Plus in Peru is funding uh, uh, governance strengthening initiatives. And this definitely helps us to um, reach a more um, fair scenario on land use in Peru. Now, um, it is a market mechanism, and that is why I think we should give a market mechanism its own position, its, its own fair position, but it shouldn't be central to our uh, governance uh, policies. And um, I was wondering what, what do you think about Red Plus and what position it should take in national policy on land use? 
Yeah, we'll work backwards. So those questions are fresher in our minds. Yes, I will answer because I think it is a very challenging and interesting question. And it has been going, cutting through, you know, these last years of advocacy and of working with indigenous peoples, but also with more, let's say, environmental groups and also groups that are critical to reg. I can answer, I can start because there was also another thing I wanted to, to touch on, upon. I've been following also part of the discussion on reg plus in, in Peru, especially the work done by the Forest Investment uh, Program. And uh, I think that, and, and many, also Mina can actually contribute to that, many indigenous organizations have been looking at RED as a window of opportunity to introduce those governance changes we're talking about, and uh, basically use it as a Trojan horse to open up a platform of negotiation with governments on issues that otherwise would have never been touched upon. And as somebody was saying before, the UNSCC is a climate change convention, but it's also a forest convention by proxy. If you look at the, the past history of the failure of Rio 92 to, to establish a forest convention and then the need to use this vector to introduce forest-related issues, again, it's a, it's a proxy. And RED has been considered for many organizations as a proxy or a Trojan horse to engage with governments on the issue of land rights, and uh, you know, recognition of indigenous people's rights to free prior informed consent. Mm -hmm. This is not the case in Peru when you talk about consulta previa. The point we have, I mean, some of the issues that are still very relevant, that has not, have not been properly addressed in the red discussion, especially what we're talking about, red, what we're talking about. Are we talking about the readiness? Are we talking about implementation or results-based payments? And uh, we've already been experiencing this problem in the sequencing. Because we started with readiness when you actually have to deal with the right, with the, with the landscape, the political landscape, with the, with what are the instruments that are required to ensure rights, but then all of a sudden you jump immediately to the results based payments. So there is yet no clear mechanism in place to ensure the respect of rights, while there is a lot of pressure to start dealing with carbon. But still, Red has been a very interesting vector, and it can still is, as far as it's a platform where these kind of negotiations can take place. The second point is about the land conflicts and land competition over scarce land. Yeah, the other question to ask to ourselves is whose land are we talking about? Uh, and indeed, you know, this it, 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 you know, brings me back to the memory of when I first lost, looked at a map that was uh, designed after 10 years of work by indigenous people in Guyana, the Wapichan. I was looking at this map, you know, and uh, I couldn't realize how important it was for them that they had a map where they could visualize the land and the, the, the borders of their rights, their, their sovereign rights. And then I asked one of the chiefs from Guyana, say, tell me, I mean, I see these borders. Some of them are clear designed, are, others are just random. There is no co co coherent line. What are these? Oh, these are the areas we negotiate. So, you know, when we're talking about conflicting land, land titling, we're talking about drawing borders, right? And I realize that indigenous peoples can draw the borders from within, but they also should negotiate the borders from without. What does it mean? That when you talk about small scale, uh, landowners that are having, or people that are receiving rights to land, I'm thinking for instance about the uh, Semterra in Brazil, you need to create a situation where those excluded from access to land or land rights can negotiate, can create a common platform, can don't be end up by being actors of a war against the poor, but you know, just being able to negotiate and to recognize that each of the people, rights holders that live in Alaska, actually have equitable access. Although there is a distinction because with indigenous people we're talking about self-determination rights that are specifically different from other local communities or farmers. Lastly, um, RED, uh, we, my organization has been engaging also in a kind of assessment where we are at in terms of RED. And we ended up by thinking that all RED discussion has been very helpful in identifying some toolkits or some tools for indigenous peoples to reclaim their rights. Bring it more down level to district government. Uh, there's a big enthusiasm uh, now uh, from local government uh, 
district government to have uh, local regulations that are cognizant of indigenous people's rights and also customary forests. And my organization, Aman, we've been working, we are working now with several uh, local governments, uh, supporting them on uh, making the local regulations uh, for the rights of indigenous peoples. We already have some local government come up, coming out with the, uh, it's called Perda, national, the local regulation like Malinau in East Kalimantan, or Burukumba, or Nagari. So that, that is uh, the thing. So. And, and, and about the red place and how, how we saw that. For us in Amman especially, if you go back to like 10 years ago, uh, there's not much discussion about indigenous people's rights. We try to bring this up to, uh, to the government too. But until, but now, actually we have more recognition of our rights, especially on our territory and things. What, what the challenge for us is how to provide evidence that we are the, the, the rights owner, the rights holder. And this evidence we provide with of mapping, participatory mapping, with you know uh, uh, document documentation of our traditional knowledge on managing our territories and, and I think this is the way we start working with governments for now. Because I think we're running out of time. So. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, there on the, the global rights discussion and the national rights discussion where there is no, there is a mismatch uh, coming from Africa. I would understand what you're trying to say and that's true, that's what's happening. We can have any kind of rules, principles at global level, but in Africa, in LDCs, at the national level, there is no um, uh, uh, mechanism to implement those. It is in the books, it is clear, but it doesn't. Because when it is there for people to, to, to ask for it, it's, it should be demanded. But I think that's the responsibility of civil society in those countries to, to create awareness amongst the communities to raise this issue. That is very clear. But I don't think we can ignore, because at community level or at the national level there is no demand, that international levels will have to ignore setting up principles from the beginning in, in any uh, climate policies. I think it's essential, first of all, we have to have that, but our struggle at national level should be uh, you know, uh, accelerated. It is an area where there is a critical problem, I agree that, and it's something that we have to work on. We've had some really great questions and we do want to continue this dialogue with the last week in Lima. I think we'll take a couple more questions and then at the end I'm going to send around a name and email sheet so you can sign up and see if you want to be included in these conversations either by email or in person while we're here and then know that we'll continue this conversation um, in, in the future. But I saw a question here and then one in the back. Thank you very much. Um, my name, I'm Joanna Durbin of the Climate Community and Biodiversity Alliance, and uh, it's a very interesting discussion. And it, actually, the question I had formulated earlier, Francesco dealt with a bit, uh, and, and also just now. Um, but rights-based approach sounds it, it sounds clear. You know, d different groups and different people have rights, and and, and they need to be respected. Um, but of course, and, and you, you've referred to this a bit. You know, there are conflicting rights. There are there are you know groups that have rights to food and, and food security, and others that have rights to land based on ancestral tradition, and and sometimes they come up against each other. And you mentioned an approach of, of negotiation, um, and and I suppose it's just a, a, a comment, but also a, an interest in your sort of feedback as to whether. <clears throat> There's a reflection in this approach of, of how that is dealt with, um, and, and of course thinking about rights of current generations and future generations who are not here to negotiate or are uncontacted people. So, you know, it, it gets complicated. So um, I, I'm just interested in your reflections on how that is recognised within a rights-based approach. Hi, my name is Nirajani Amarasimha and I work at the Center for International Environmental Law with Ali. I'm going to stand here so people can see me. So I, I had two reflections that I 
wanted to share, and I'm uh, very interested to know what the panel thinks. Uh, the first is, it's, it's really an opportunity to point out that uh, we're having a you know, relatively focused discussion on the land sector, but these issues of rights do impact other sectors. And there is quite a bit of uh, talk right now about climate change and human rights, a rights-based approach to climate change, and what can be done in the context of the 2015 agreement to have that overarching message conveyed to ensure that countries are respecting their rights, that there is a specific call for respecting the existing obligations that they have at the international level. Uh, and there's a letter that's going around that over 160 organizations have already signed, and I think they're still trying to gather momentum for this call. And, and I think just in response to one of the, the questions about, well, what, what does that mean concretely? Right? We can call for the recognition, but then what next? And there I wanted to draw attention to the fact that 28 independent experts of the Human Rights Council wrote to the UNFCCC parties and, and called for this recognition of human rights, but also they suggested having some kind of work program. Now we can, you know, we can debate whether or not that's the right thing, but I think there is an opportunity there that there are experts in the human rights regime who are ready and willing to work with the UNFCCC and to get this dialogue going about what in fact it means to work at the intersection of human rights and climate change. And there could be a lot there both more broadly, but also for the land use, uh, the, the land sector, because there are some things that are unique, like the fungibility question, <coughs> the, the, the interconnection with mitigation and adaptation. That brings me to my second point, and this deals with this question of carbon and focusing on carbon. Yes, the objective of the convention says we have to avoid dangerous anthropogenic climate change, but it also mentions that we have to do it in a way that allows ecosystems to adapt naturally, that we have to do it in the context of sustainable development. So to me, the convention is not just about reducing emissions, it matters how. It matters how we reduce emissions. And, and this is playing out in, in little ways, the non-carbon benefits discussion in Red Plus, in the Green Climate Fund, the discussion of co-benefits. But the concern that I have is with this focus of carbon, it moves ahead, leaving everything else behind, which means that you're not actually taking an integrated approach where you're finding that sweet spot with mitigation, adaptation, rights, biodiversity, and I talk about environmental integrity in this context, not from just from an accounting perspective, but biodiversity. So I just, I, I want to throw that out there because of the ADP discussions that are so focused on mitigation and emission reductions, and you know, what we need to be doing there to try to address some of these issues. Thank you. Thanks. I think these are really good questions. I hope you are as excited to continue to talk about them as we are here. I think we'll finish up with responding to those questions and any last minute thoughts. Um, thanks. I think we could almost just finish here because that was a great input from um, Nira. But as a quick response to those, one of the earlier questions referred to carbon sequestration. And I just wanted to sort of emphasize the point I was making in my presentation is that there are environmentally determined limits to sequestration in land. It's called sink saturation. In terms of um, conserving existing carbon stocks, so conserv conserving existing forests, there are not limits to that, we should conserve all existing forests. But there is no scientific credibility to the idea that conserving forests or avoiding deforestation in any way um, justifies ongoing fossil fuel emissions. Now, that, that actually exists in current policy, it's called um, forest carbon offsets. And it's, it's that that leads us into a lot of accounting complexity and a focus on carbon. And what we're trying to say here is if we pull back from that, if we recognize that those two types of carbon, terrestrial carbon emissions and fossil carbon emissions, are not fungible, we could have much more simple accounting regimes. In fact, they would be called reporting requirements, as already exist for developing countries under um, the UNFCCC. They already report on their land carbon stocks. And that simplicity would leave more space for issues like Francesco was talking about, the focus on carbon means we've skipped straight to carbon rights and we're not dealing properly with rights. We need to simplify accounting and actually deal with rights. If we pull back from the focus on carbon, we, um, we can address food security, we can look at ways, we can look at exactly what Nero was saying, exactly how we reduce emissions in the land sector. 
not just looking at carbon, but how we reduce them so that they address biodiversity and they address the whole range of concerns. And so I think that um, we're not saying mitigation from the land sector is not important, it's critically important, but it's not fungible, so we don't need complex accounting rules and we need a broader definition of how we report and look at that mitigation. I think that Joanna pointed a very important element about that actually rings the bell to me because when we talk about a rights based approach, then we look into the operational aspects of it. So you establish safeguards, but then you need to establish an implementing framework. An implementation framework requires also the capacity to recourse, or to complain. So the capacity of having an independent body for indigenous communities, local communities that are affected to seek for compensation or for arbitration. And uh, so if I look at, for instance, what we're talking about here, land-based approach to mitigation and adaptation, and we locate a new, uh, the, the discussion in a climate change negotiation, there is no such a thing as a recourse mechanism or a complaint body. Actually, there is one, but it's just for the interest of the sheikhs. I mean, the, the forum on, uh, on the impact of response measures is only about how to compensate for the losses of the oil producing countries because you actually have to address the issue of fossil fuel consumption. But there is a space. So maybe that forum could be retrofitted to become a space where rights holders can go and seek for, you know, and seek for compensation for the response of uh, wrongly designed response measures, or impact of wrongly designed response measures like red, like mitigation or adaptation. So sometimes you actually don't need to reinvent the wheel, but just we're creatively on what the institutional framework offers you. No, I just wanted to say, I, I, I wanted to refrain from saying this, but I think I should, I would say it. And it's a simple thing with the right, uh, the human rights issue. I, I always thought that the climate issue is a human rights issue because for what I said, I mean, especially for, uh, for countries in the developing world because their life is disrupted because of other people's uh, responsibility. So uh, their right is violated. So I think it should be the center of all uh, of the discussion of climate change. Yeah, I, I think it's a simple thing, but I think it's a, a very important issue. How do we insert it? How do we uh, do it? It's a very complicated issue. I can't comment. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, I think I will close by just trying to motivate you again to, to join us in this network. We are at a very critical time right now as we're negotiating the next climate agreement. And the ADP, where this idea of the land sector and how it's going to contribute to mitigation and adaptation is a perfect place and a perfect time to do this. Again, we're not just focusing on mitigation here. The ADP has allows us to focus on both, and this is the time that we're going to do it. it it's wonderful to see so many people here. Thank you so much for your, for your time and your comments, and please do stay in touch with us. As I said, I'll put a sign-up sheet on that side and on that side, and maybe you can come up, share your emails, and we'll be in touch with you. Have a great rest of the day.